Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together we can make it happen. I'm Manda Scott, your host at this place on the web where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, all in the service of conscious evolution. My guest this week is a longtime friend and mentor, and one of the people for whom I have the highest respect. Jonathan Dawson leads, co-created, teaches, holds the space for the Masters in Regenerative Economics at Schumacher College. And if you've listened to this podcast before, you'll know that I did that Masters back in 2016-17. And Jonathan was and is a revelation in terms of his capacity for emotional, mental, spiritual and energetic flexibility. He's an economist, but as he will tell us, he's also a storyteller. He's an extraordinary educator with a capacity for creating a learning space that gives agency to everyone in the classroom that is unmatched in my previous experience. He has an incredibly lively, inquiring mind, and the conversation we just had ranged far more widely than I had expected it to, but then I should have expected it to range that widely and reach places that I found really inspiring, and I hope you do too. So people of the podcast, please welcome Jonathan Dawson. So Jonathan Dawson, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast. It is such a delight to have you on. I've been planning this since before we started way back in 2019. So thank you for being here. Well, you know, I, I just want to I want to return the compliment by by saying that that I often think back to your interview for this course. It's now called Regenerative Economics Master's Program. It used to be called Economics for Transition. And in your interview, when asked why would a former vet who's in shamanic studies want to study economics, and um, you said uh, two things: one, the gods told me to. And secondly, I want to write the script for the revolution. Did I say that? There we go. And now we've written it. We just need the money. Yes. We just need a billionaire or two to fund it. But I am now apparently one degree of separation away from Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. So who knows? They may those degrees may not happen, but it's always worth a try. So so we're here and we really want to talk about how we do write the script for the revolution, how we change things. But before we leap into that. Could we have a really edited highlight of how you came to be the person who is running Regenerative Economics Masters at Schumacher and within that, the understanding that we need to change the frame? Yeah, interesting. So I think for, for maybe a, bit, a good way in here is that to say that for much of my working life, when people have referred to me as an economist, I've tended to look over my shoulder and wonder who they were speaking about. The cap has never really fitted, at least in terms of conventional market-based economics as mathematics. I think I've always been at least as interested in culture, particularly theater, language, story, as in the raw bones of economics. And I find the, the meeting point between them, like I think it is such a, a point of power is where the arts meet political economy. And so I think I've always said that maybe coming from an Irish background will have done no harm. But definitely when I was designing, co-designing the economics master's program here at the college, it, it felt like the question of narratives, the conceptual sea in which we swim that we're largely aware of, the power of language to frame in ways, subversive ways that we're generally not even conscious of, narratives that we're surrounded by that deeply condition, condition our thinking. And I've always felt that insofar as we're involved in micro-level, really important community-based stuff, that as long as we're not challenging those core narratives, we're swimming upstream. Yes. So my interest really is turning the narrative around so that we're swimming with the tide, with the, with the, with the current rather than against continuing. Yes. So before we look into how we can change the narrative, where do you think the current conceptual sea in which we swim, what are its baselines, its skeleton, its structure? What is it that we all are so imbued with that we don't challenge it? 
Do you know, I think there's two layers. The, the, the short-term layer is neoliberal capitalism and the, the very clever association of free markets, like the, the, the embodied metaphor of freedom. Hmm. So even though we know from a study of how markets work that there is no such thing as a free market, certainly not at the moment, but nonetheless, the, the use of that language makes it a very difficult concept to challenge. Uh, and also concepts like growth and development, growth being another embodied metaphor that we know from many people like George Lakoff and many others, Tom Crompton, others who we've worked with on this program, that it's really difficult to challenge an embodied metaphor. So growth is a universally good thing. Yeah. So anyway, at the first near level is capitalism. At the deeper level is what people like Thomas Berry and more recently Charles Eisenstein have described as a myth of separation. So really the heritage going all the way back to Plato and beyond, certainly through the Judeo-Christian lineage of the profound separation of humans, of subject from object, of humans from the rest of the natural world, of the, the stories that end up that we in our culture find ourselves alone and miserable in a, in a, in a dead universe. Just a story, and it's quite unlike the stories that most civilizations have held before us. Yes. I was thinking also, partly because of something that our mutual friend Della Duncan posted recently. She's working with Fritjof Capra, but she did a podcast about work and about the myth of the disutility of work. And yes, I was yes. thinking about that, that within neoliberal capitalism, this concept that everybody has to work to make money, but that we don't actually want to work. So we have to have the carrot and the stick. The carrot is the money, but the stick is the threat of impoverishment or homelessness or all of those things. Yes. And yet there is also within our culture, within this myth of personal freedom, everyone is sold the story that they can be the best of themselves, grow up to do what it is that they want to do, and that in fact we should be seeking the things that make our hearts explode and that enable us to flourish in the world. And the people who believe this system seem to be able to hold at the same time the concept that they and their friends have a right to do the work that enlivens them and gives them great satisfaction while everybody else is doing work that they hate. Yes. And I would really dearly like to sit somebody down who holds this and, and see how they manage to hold that cognitive dissonance in their heads. So, because everybody listening isn't necessarily an economist, can we unpick a little bit further what it is about neoliberal capitalism that makes it so compelling, that has made it function to the point that it has, and perhaps have a look at also where the deep holes are? Because I, I had a conversation recently with a friend who I respect highly, who has made more money probably than anybody else I know out of this system, who who genuinely says, yes, but you may not like capitalism, but most of the people in the world have now been lifted out of poverty and therefore it's good. And, and I end up not challenging that because the assumptions underlying it are so many and so profoundly wrong to me that I, I don't know where to start without getting really cross. So can we be Begin to unpick that a little bit. Yes, yes. So the the um, the neoliberal revolution really, I mean, it was being planned through from really from the Second World War, but didn't really find a place in government policy until the late nineteen seventies. And the the, like, the core assumption is that wealth is generated by the market. So the question of neoliberalism as a particularly virulent form of capitalism. Maybe just in parenthesis, I can say at the moment that what we're trying to do at the moment, it's a very exciting moment where many of the old stories are, I think Thomas Berry was the first one to say that we live in a moment between stories. And in this period, what we want to develop is intelligent, critical thinking. And words like capitalism and communism, I almost never use them because as soon as you use them, they trigger associations in the mind of the listener, which means in most cases, either Yes, I'm on that side or the other side of the baddies and they're, they're communists or they're, or they're capitalists. And really what is happening at the moment is so much more interesting than 
the debate that dominated the 20th century, which is that between should we have more state or should we have more market? Is it socialist or is it capitalist? In terms of like specifically what is distinctive about neoliberalism, its distinctiveness is a radical assertion that value is generated by the markets and that the role of the state should be limited to the degree possible. And that really the state should not be doing much more than what than correcting what economists call market failures. Mm. And so the state is recognized by neoliberals as having a legitimate role in intervening to correct that. But as a fundamental rule, and this is very much playing on, am I going to remember Reagan's phrase, something like the nine most dangerous words in the English language are, hello, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. Yes. And so that's the, that's the assertion is value is generated by the market and the value creators, in other words, the Richard Branson's and Jeff Bezos of this world, are entitled to whatever recompense comes their way and the state should not intervene to redistribute because they are the wealth creators. Right. Now, enter stage left the wonderful Mariana Mazzucato, yes. who's written a number of books. I've recently read her Mission Economy, but I think it's the third or fourth of her books that I've read where she, not from an ideological position, but simply looking empirically at the story of capitalism in the 20th century, has revealed, has made clear, has retold the story that um, the, the role of the state has been core, has been central. And she does these lovely little little vignettes, so she takes apart a, a smartphone, smartphone and looks at all of the different elements and components that go to make up a smartphone and all of them generated by state-funded research, yeah. a lot of it around the mission, Moon Mission Project. And looking again, the example of vaccines, at the moment, free market promoters are looking at vaccines and using it as an example of the merits, the efficiency, the potential to scale up of the markets. And Matsukatu, you know, is one of a number who's looking at the, the actual record and noticing that the private sector is really strong at doing research, funding research, at the end of the process. So the early stages of the process are hit and miss. You never really quite know which is going to be the, the horse you need to back. There's a lot of heavy duty research that goes in. And then once that work has been done, the corporations come in and issue patents, you know, and set up a substantial revenue chains for wealth that has been generated by the body public through the state. Right. The profits are privatized. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think it's another thing we're getting from the response to the pandemic is the, the recognition that the real wealth creators and the essential workers are not those who we have so far identified as being such. Yeah. And noticing that the real essential workers are the ones that are paid the least. So I think that what we're getting here is a is a nexus of different understandings and narratives that are challenging the core narrative of who are the wealth creators. I think this is this is I think we're surrounded at the moment by tipping points waiting to be activated. This is socio-cultural narrative level tipping points waiting to be activated. And I think this is a critical one is who are the wealth creators. And really Mariana Matsukato's work is exemplary. And who are the wealth creators in our current culture? And what is the cost of that? Because it seems to me that we could challenge that narrative and point out that we really need nurses and paying the 1% is risable while you're paying 32 billion to your friends to recycle bin bags as PPE. I think what's become so obvious with the current administration is that kind of kleptocratic establishment class that's very, very good at siphoning public money into its own hands. Yes. Even if we challenge that and go, okay, we need to do what it seems like Joe Biden might be trying to do and create you know, a multi-billion pound care sector where people actually get paid proper money for caring for people. Yes. That doesn't change the underlying catastrophe of our time, which is that climate change is a market failure. Uh, I love that. I, I love the concept of that. We, we made a bit of a mistake, guys, but we're going to become extinct. But don't worry, we'll we'll just tweak. The it's a tweak. A it's a tweak. We just tweak and it. it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, because the whole principle of the environmental impact, I something I think George Monbiot wrote over the weekend that there's the new big net 
Netflix C story, the name of which is currently escapes me. And he said that the people getting really cross about that were the same ones who were publishing papers about underutilized fishing areas about 10 years ago, meaning places that hadn't actually been fished to extinction. I know, I know, I know. And the power of the language to totally frame us. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we are now within d- a decade of having sterile seas because up until now it's been the place where we dumped all the crap and, and we could infinitely fish from it. And that's more than just a neoliberal concept, it seems to me. Even if we were still within some other kind of financial construct, that goes back to what you're talking about is the separation. Well, I think that that's just exactly where, what I was thinking was that that this is the point at which we move beyond the tribal battles within socialism, capitalism from the 19th century onwards, and we look back yeah. to something that that really got teeth in the post-Enlightenment period. I mean, Descartes' famous, I think, therefore I am, hating of human beings as being outside of the family of life with the mandate, and again, this goes all the way back to the Judeo-Christian roots of of stewardship and control and domination over the other the human world. Yeah. The core question here being, what is wealth? So before we look at who are the wealth creators, what is wealth? Yes. The association of wealth to what passes through the market is so deeply ingrained, so successfully languaged, that really our prime ministers and ministers of finance need to stand up once a year and describe the percentage, or they used to, the percentage by which GDP has grown, no longer do that. But they used to, and really didn't need to say anything more because the work had already been done at the narrative level. GDP is going up, good thing, we're, we're going the right direction. Now, over the years, there have been numerous critiques of this position. So the, the idea that wealth is measured in monetary terms by what passes through the market on the grounds that there are many things that pass through the market that do not generate value. So we're looking at defense, defense, the very word defense, arms spending. It's not defense, it's assault. Is And you know, the, the Bobby Kennedy speech of, of 68, I think it was, where he says, you know, it counts the napalm, it counts the, the destruction of the highways, it counts, and he finishes by saying it counts everything except that which, which makes worth li- life worth living. Mm. Yeah. And I think what we're seeing at the moment, and this is, I mean, it, it feels a little callous to speak of the pandemic as opportunity, but nonetheless, we need to be looking for silver linings. And silver lining here being that the potential to generate profit in a context where there is massive disruption, both from probably a rolling set of, pand- of pandemics coming in hmm. to get with climate change, that we simply need an expanded state playing a greater driving, guiding role in a context in which wealth will be health. Right, yes. And could it be that we will get to this place not as a result of winning ideological battles, but simply because there is no choice? We think there's no choice. I I look at Rishi Sunak or the American right, and I'm not sure they would agree with that. Well, 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 let, let's look at them. This is really interesting because the current government in the UK, which is probably the most right wing we've ever had, are enacting policies that were Jeremy Corbyn to be enacting, which he would be were he prime minister, he would be slated. Of course. Totally. So this very right wing government is intervening both in climate change and in or rather addressing the impacts of climate change and hopefully being shamed as the host for the next COP in really significant action, but definitely intervening heavily in softening the blow to the economy uh, generated by the pandemic. So it's reached these positions not as a result of any ideological persuasion, but because it hasn't had a choice. What worries me about this is that it's doing it within the same old narrative. So Rishi Sunak is already laying the ground for the austerity that will have to come to pay for the fact that everybody had some free money last year without any acknowledgement that the free money was basically numbers on a spreadsheet and he does not have to take in tax to balance it out. We had Richard Murphy on the podcast a few weeks ago explaining modern monetary theory, so we don't need to go into that in great detail, but they're not changing their narrative. They are they are warning everybody already 
that we will have to pay for this, which I assume means we sell off the NHS to our friends in America. And at the same time, they are becoming socially more repressive, that, you're right, than, than any government we have ever seen or you know, pretty much anywhere outside of totalitarian states. And I'm kind of interested that you think that they're really acting on climate change because I'm watching them thinking, you, you guys are living in a fantasy land. So I'm reading Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future. And one of the early statistics is 500 billion tonnes of CO2 burned or CO2 equivalents. If we go over that, we are in absolutely irreversible climate change like four to eight degrees by the end of the century, which is not compatible with with any kind of life at all. Not even this super rich people in Silicon Valley, you know, building themselves bunkers or trying to moonshot to Mars. And we are currently burning 40 billion tons a year. So that's eight years to change the ship, the direction of how we do business and how we work and how many trident missiles we build to prove that our prime minister has a bigger dick than anybody else or whatever it is he's trying to prove and you're naughty <laughs> well what else is he doing it for i mean honestly is this because they've seen the numbers and they think we're going to have to defend our tiny little island against the millions who will be displaced really with with nuclear missiles are you kidding me sorry so so what are what are you seeing that gives you hope that they're actually acting because it feels like you're seeing a kind of nixon in china moment that i'm not yeah so I, I'm, I'm i'm really not <laughs> darn maybe a little bit of background here is that the, the master's program we launched here a decade ago was called economics for transition and uh from this year it's called regenerative economics and we didn't change the title because i lost hope in the transition like certainly 10 years ago when we started the program, when I looked in the new economics toolkit, I saw grants for optimism that we could have a transition, a soft landing transition. And fundamentally, I no longer believe that to be possible. Okay. So do I see narratives changing, policies like changing, structures, behaviors changing quickly enough to enable us to make the kind of changes that we need to keep, that what the scientists tell us we need to keep temperatures down below 1.5 or even 2 degrees. I mean, honestly, I, I can't look myself in the mirror and, and say that I truly believe that to be true. R Richard Heinberg wrote a piece recently where he said the new, the new avenue that we need to put on our map is what he calls brace for impact. And I think we're in that territory. Okay. However, like that said, we are a meaning-making species. And it seems to me that much of the mental illness and suicide and antidepressants and drugs in our society result from the cognitive dissonance between the dominant stories that we're inhabiting and the reality that we actually sense around us. We're not able to, we're not able to take in the data, the happenings that, of the world in which we are embedded and make a tally increasingly with the dominant stories of our moment. Yep. One of the manifestations of that is that my feeling is that in most cases, young people no longer believe they can change anything. They no longer believe they've got agency. There's a lack of deep lack of meaning in a way that was not true for my generation. The first half of my career was in, in West Africa. And I mean, really, I, 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 had, I had belief that actually we were turning the ship around and we were doing great things. And, and some of the things we were doing were not bad at all. I used to work with um, Intermediate Technology Development Group or associated with ITDG, the organization that Schumacher created. And much of the work we were doing was inspiring. And many of the first generation of African, post-Africa, post-independence African leaders were inspired, inspiring people who were really surfing an ideological wave. And this is the non-aligned movement, uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah and um, Patrice Lumumba, a whole generation of them, really. Whereas today, I think what, I, what I'm seeing is a profound sense of alienation from the world of work, of alienation from, of, of having a societal story of what we're actually doing and how that may contribute to making society a better place. Like there's lots of teeming individual initiatives, but I think the dominant mode is lethargy, alienation, and depression. And are you seeing that more in the students now? Not, not in our students. Like our students, we're fortunate that really we have a self-selecting group. What gives me meaning 
is this story that actually working at the narrative level and finding a way of framing, understanding this moment in history in a way that gives energy and purpose and dynamism to the generations to come is the work that I think I find myself doing. Okay, that's sounding good. Energy, work, purpose and dynamism to the generations to come. Maybe I can just add that one, one little thing to that is, and so another plug for Mariana Matsukato is a mission, mission economy. She's really painting in very tangible sense, and she's working directly with governments in Europe and, and the US, and the UK and elsewhere. Her own mission is to generate the same sense of mission that the US had through the 1960s to get someone on the moon. Yes. So mobilizing the public imagination and genius and power for the collective good, but it needs to be articulated, it needs to be mobilized around particular missions. Right. And um, I think the fact that she is not just talking about the desirability, but it's actually describing her work right. in the chambers of power, uh, I find very powerful. Yeah. And that narrative is being picked up by the American administration. Joe Biden has already spoken about that sense of a moonshot with respect to the vaccine. But if you can do it with the vaccine, then... Yes. I think he gets climate change in ways that I didn't realise he did when I was thinking. He's surprising me too. Yeah, it's very good. So, although he has to get stuff through a Senate that lives in the wrong generation. But anyway, let's not get hooked up on that. How then, in your view, and having just spent a whole module working with some of the brightest students we can get, what is the new narrative that we need to bring out? And how can we get it beyond our echo chamber? So the first part is what are the new narratives? Um, I'm a little bit resistant to the question, and that is because uh, a really important element, a really important foundation stone of the course that I teach that you have done is complexity theory. Okay, yes. It's, it's the idea of emergence and the idea that, you know, we can we can have intelligent guesses, but fundamentally the future we can read patterns but we certainly can't predict sure and i'm a 60 plus year old and i'm not going to really this is not an avoidance of the question it's it's a it's a real reluctance to frame and define a story that that, that can't be conceptualized in the abstract but that must be lived okay by those by, by future generations I'm going to take us back to africa at the minute again in the late 70s early 80s when i started working there that there was a very strong sense of purpose and mobilization and like a generation had its mission, which was the post-colonial rebuilding of the, of the colonies. Now, for various reasons, not least because of the intervention of European and American powers to decapitate the leadership of many of these movements. Yeah. Um, and then the imposition of structural adjustment over a couple of decades, which effectively... My M. Phil dissertation was on the theme of is there a distinctly African root of industrialization that is distinctive that builds on the cultural roots of Africa? And you know, when I wrote it, the answer was was a definite yes. But by the time neoliberal revolution coming to Africa and simply forcing them to, in exchange for financing hmm. for debts, totally open their economy in such a way that they couldn't possibly compete against the global players. Which was the point, I'm sure. Alrighty. But that sense of purpose and mobilisation, because I absolutely hear you about complexity. That's a foundation stone of accidental gods. But I think still there are underlying concepts, underlying belief systems, underlying realities that yeah. our generation can begin to shift, given, given that we are the inheritors of everything that went before. We've done really well. You and I both went to college at a time when it was free, all of those things. We can we can find some threads of things that we can believe in, that we can begin to live, that then those will ripple out and emerge in the ways that they emerge. Yes? Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Um, I'm thinking of Wangari Matai, for formidable, now deceased, but formidable Kenyan woman, who created the Green Belt Movement, she and her fellow uh, peasants across Kenya, now internationally planting millions of trees. Wow. 
Um, so, like, she she came to me. She wanted to speak, and I simply gave voice to her. Are you aware of the? Um, you will be aware, I'm sure, of the Friedman, the famous Milton Friedman quote. Uh, again, he is one of the leading figures in, in terms of the development of neoliberalism, and the quote being something like, "Crises will roll in, and when they roll in, governments will cast around looking for p- policies, new policies to implement." Yes. But at the moment, is to make sure that the policies that we develop are the ones they reach for. Yes, yes. Now, I have got a very strong sense. I, th- I, think, I don't think I've ever really ever believed that we would reform our way incrementally towards a sustainable, just global economy. I think I've always had the... My theory of change has always been based on converging crises and the opportunity that those crises will present. Hmm. So, as I said before, it seems to me that the... The pandemic on one on the one hand and climate change impacts on the other are converging in such a way that that there's real questions. Again, I want to bring in Tim Jackson here in his recent book, Post Post Growth, I think. Where really he's making the case. And I I find it very convincing that actually the core conditions upon which the profit maximizing machine of continual capital accumulation that is capitalism, the conditions on which it needs, that, that it needs in order to thrive, to, to even even exist, are beginning to shrink. Okay. And consequently, that as, as, as I said before, that actually governments are finding themselves enacting policies in response particularly to the pandemic that are totally at odds with their ideological position in terms of free markets because they don't really have a choice. And so it seems to me that the popular mobilization, as we saw, I think we may well look back in 2011 as being a critical year. Like we don't see it at the moment, but I think that the global risings in 2011, I mean, starting with the Occupy movement, but really spreading through the Arab Spring and massive demonstrations around the world, that we may well look back and this as being a year of critical importance, resetting the frame of what is possible and opening a space for much more community-driven, democratically-driven response to crisis. Mm -hmm. Okay, because a lot of the generation who were really touched by Occupy are now a decade older, a decade more into their own agency, I think. And it does seem really to be the people that I know who've been involved with that are definitely working at community levels. Yes. And, and are ignoring national politics because it's not relevant to them. Yes, so much more, but the far more interesting things happening at municipal level. Amanda, there's one, there's one other thread I can weave in here that I think pulls together many of the threads we've been talking about so far. And that is, so it, again, looking at the level of narrative. So when I was working in West Africa uh, during the, the neoliberal period, structural adjustment, lib- um, economic liberalization being imposed in the countries of the South, which hollowed out their own indigenous economies. It was a difficult period because those in the World Bank and the other organizations that were driving the process would point to the government and say, they're patently inefficient. And I would look and we would look and go, they're right. But then when Thatcher with her Tina, there is no alternative, we didn't really have an answer. It was like, God, we can we agree that actually state, generally state institutions are not working but there wasn't really any other part of the map other than market or state. Yeah. Now, what's happened over the last 20 years is a rediscovery of the commons. Right. A whole, so suddenly, and by, by the commons, I mean governance not by the market, governance not by the state, but by community-based, community-driven enterprise or initiatives. This is the territory that Eleanor Ostrom, Nobel Prize winning economist, spent her life really working on like demonstrating, providing a language for a third pole, hmm. independent of the state and independent of the market. And suddenly the map enlarges. If I can just like a little, a little uh, subplot to this, is that one of the reasons why it re-emerged was the emergence of the digital commons in the global north, that the whole area, the internet enabling all multiple forms of mutual peer-to-peer organization independent of the state and the markets. Yeah. And, the, the, and then the, the, the realization that actually the principles you're talking about in the digital commons 
are very much mirrored by the more land-based indigenous governments in the global south. So what has happened is that over the last 20, 30 years, the map of possibilities has suddenly dramatically expanded, primarily because we've rediscovered a language to describe what was there, but we weren't really noticing it. And I think this is really powerful. And that's where I thought you were going, talking about Africa, because I thought you were going to say, yes, the World Bank thought all the governments were patently inefficient, but actually what they were doing was looking after people, and that's much more important than getting a GDP of 5% of whatever it was that they were asking for, that their inefficiencies were not relevant because what they were doing was supporting a community. Is it the case that that was so, or was it just that there was corruption and that the systems of governance were not very good? So it, it, actually it was a whole other range of activities that usually goes under the name of import substitution. So recognising that if you were to break the dependency on the northern base that uh-huh. in the northern hemisphere, you would need to create infrastructure to enable the domestic production of goods to replace the imports. Right. The problem was that in, in most of these African countries, it's not just Africa, but uh, Latin America, for example, a very strong movement as well, and Southeast Asia. The private sector wasn't strong enough to be able to drive this process of import substitution, so the state came in and played a guiding role. And in many cases, um, partly because of corruption and partly because of getting consultancy and other advice from the North that was designed to make them fail. John John's Confessions of an Economic Hitman, strongly recommend. Yes. Um, so partly because of, of corruption domestically and partly because of cynical sabotage. Right, okay. By physical decapitation of the leadership or providing advice to African countries that they should, for example, build production facilities way in excess of their local ability to fight for. And consequently, they were deeply inefficient and we, we needed to find another way. But at that stage, the map was the market and the state. Yeah. Being a third route, which I think increasingly is opening up, partly in response to crisis and partly in response to the internet, the opportunities offered by the internet is that we are seeing a resurgence in commons-based initiatives. And for me, this is where the excitement is. And I think this is where the the new generation, its digital savvy, its passion, its desire to find a mission for this generation will find a way of manifesting in ways that I cannot possibly, being an analog 20th century being, can't even imagine. Yeah, I think our brains are wired differently. Um, there's a brilliant podcast with Jamie Will, I think, describing his 12-year-old daughter, and this was a couple of years ago, but even so. And he set her the challenge, because he's a serial entrepreneur, that over the summer holidays, if she could get seven of her friends, and her thing was Minecraft, and they just had to create something on Minecraft that he'd never seen before, he would then pay her an amount of money that was was worth doing this. So capitalism in action. And he said, she went, oh, okay. And um, within a day, she'd got seven friends all around the world somewhere who were prepared to do this. And then he watched them all summer and they were just playing Minecraft. And they get to like a week before the end and he's going, did you actually want the money? And she's going, oh, yeah. And within that last week, he said he saw in operation something that he doesn't want to name because simply in naming it, he would be tying it into his worldview. Yes. But he saw seven young girls, age 12, creating something that not only had he never seen before, but he could not have conceived of. And they created it in a way that somebody was tasked with making it beautiful, somebody was tasked with writing the manual that showed how it worked, somebody else was tasked with the actual mechanics. And he said it just, it was complexity in action. And the way their minds are wired is different. And it gives me, it feels like we're kind of in a race at the moment between getting those people to the point where they have enough agency to completely transform the way the world works before the octogenarians who are currently running the show have destroyed it. But have you got, just for people listening, because we're talking about commons-based initiatives, and I imagine for most people that isn't really firing off thoughts of how that might look in their head. Have you got examples of things that you've heard of over the recent past that would flesh that out a little bit? Sure. So the most obvious example is Wikipedia, Uh, an online, voluntary, peer-to-peer encyclopedia that that has 
totally dominated the market. Uh, it's the most obvious example. Yes. Okay. But I have a but for that, which is, I'm, as you know, turning to be a homeopath and we'll leave aside whether you believe in it or not. If you post on Wikipedia anything in support of homeopathy, not only will it be removed, but, but your ISP will no longer ever be allowed to post anything onto Wikipedia wow. ever again. Wow. wow. And that's not written anywhere. It just happens. So what you have is a very, you know, we've got the the ultra libertarian, free market, Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged reading group of young men in Silicon Valley who are now defining what reality the world gets to see. So that, that, that is definitely true of the like the 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 proprietal, or the proprietary platforms like the. Um, Google, Airbnb, Uber, like clearly those are manipulating, those are deeply generating profits. It's kind of capitalism with steroids. However, like in terms of Wikipedia, and a similar thing happened with TED that actually one of my previous students, Amrita, I think she was before your time, did like one of her, one of her project assignments for this module was to create a a TED um, thing in East London, a a whole series of TED Talks. Wow. Um, at which many, many Schumacher luminaries, they're like people or guest faculty were speakers. And both Rupert Sheldrake and Graham Hart, their talks were, <laughs> were banned from... You can still find them. I will find them and put them in the show notes. But as a general rule, and like I mentioned Eleanor Ostrom before, and her work was dedicated around identifying what are the principles, since you find eight principles, you can do a web search in this, Eleanor Ostrom... And these are the principles of successful, effective, commons-based governance. Um, so you asked for an example. Let, let me give you an example. Something that's happening, a uh, really interesting thing, I keep taking, sorry, rabbit holes are just too irresistible no, not to go for it. Me. Rabbit holes are fun. I, I don't think any of the students that have gone through this 10-year program, that uh, the, this 10 years old, the 10 iterations, annual iterations of this program, I don't think ever any student ever came with the law on the radar, but a number have left with the law on the radar. Sustainable Economies Law Center in in Oakland, California, one of our, Chris Tittle, one of our graduates is working there. One of a number, and kind of recognizing that as we scan, and this is very much part of our curriculum, is scanning using Danella Meadows places to intervene in the system. Where are the entry points, the leverage points where we can, with minimum effort, have maximum impact? And the law, interestingly, is emerging as one of those leverage points. So around the world, governments are defending. They are the, they are the defense against uh, civil actions that are being taken, often on behalf of either ecosystems or future generations. Yes. So it's a lack of care and protection to which they're entitled that is not being delivered by their governments. Yes. I mentioned that that's a kind of a prelude to talking about Uber and what the trouble that Uber is in at the moment. Go on. A number of governments, a number of municipalities, including London, saying your business model is fraudulent, effectively, that you're, that these people, your workers, who you're calling associates, independent associates, and therefore you're not needing to provide sickness benefit, holiday, and so on and so forth, insurance. And increasingly, courts ruling in favour of those bringing the action. So this has led to a number, I believe, and I, I have this in second hand, but I, I, I believe that Edinburgh is a city where they're, uh, they're having quite some success in um, developing municipal funded uh, platforms of local taxi drivers. Oh, really? Brilliant. So... So whether or not it's Edinburgh, there are definitely cases there. I think Austin, Texas is another one that comes to mind where the taxi drivers are coming together and creating their own association and setting the rules over conditions of pay, over the rates that will be charged, over all the dimensions of employment policy relating to the taxi drivers in the field. So this is a really good example of a commons-based approach. In other words, we the people decide the services to be delivered, the conditions under which the workers will work in, in the sector. Yeah. So the decisions being taken democratically within a commons-based or community-based uh, structure. Brilliant. All righty. So we've got about 10 minutes left. And I'm wondering if Rishi Sunak woke up this morning and 
had a bit of a brainstorm and said, okay, what I need is Jonathan Dawson to come in and tell me how to sort out the economy. If you had, first two questions, if you had that kind of power, do you think you could engineer the soft landing? And if not, what would be your best bracing for impact strategy? Um, I, I, I'm kind of inclined to go for the archetypal Dubliner, or that rather, I think it's a Dubliner, I think it's a west of Ireland. I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> okay, so, but two, two answers. One is, in terms of significantly responding or significantly equipping yourself for brace for impact, governments may not be, like Rishi, Rishi Sunak may not be the best person to ask. You know, it's like, is I don't know if you know the, um, there's a lovely little little anecdote of someone saying that they've spent their entire life getting to the levers of power, but when they get there, they discover they're not attached to anything. I mean, I am going to come back to Richie Sunak, but let me just stay with this, this thread for a moment. Could it be that if we make it through this impact, this bottleneck in history, that actually we will look back on the 21st century, the dominant thread, the dominant theme of the age in which we live as being the transition from centralized, top-down, corporate-dominated organizational forms to distributed, internet-enabled, peer-to-peer, self-organizing forms. And again, you know, I'm aware even even as I'm speaking that these are ideological words and they're still very much in the process of taking form, of taking firm form. But I think that the general direction of travel, even with the Amazons and Ubers and Facebooks, I mean, definitely that is an aberration that we need to find a way around. But with that, those negative examples, even, even allowing that they're in the field, could it be that, the, that we will look back as the dom- at the dominant trend in the, peer- the era in which we live as being that transition to decentralised and distributed? And if that is the case, maybe Rishi Sunak is not the best informant. I just think, yes, you're right. But if he woke up tomorrow and, and enacted, let's say, our carbonite agenda, and and or even an American as of a Joe Biden agenda, and instead of giving thirty two billion to Serco to turn plastic bags into PPE, gave thirty two billion to the care industry. If he created UBI and actually dared to call it that, instead of pretending it was furlough, if he if his entire government said, "Look, guys, we haven't been honest up till now about climate change," he'd basically take on board the XR we're asking you to be honest. This is going to finish us all. We actually need to put ourselves on a war footing. Our entire economy is now focused towards whatever it takes to turn the ship around. And we will be bringing in as many people as possible to help. And if that means we dismantle government and turn ourselves into a federation of of smaller democracies, then we'll do that. Whatever it takes, we will do it because extinction is not an option. They could say that. It's my feeling is that we have this kind of Nixon in China moment where if Corbyn did that, the entire media architecture, certainly the legacy media, would jump on his head so hard you wouldn't see anything left. If someone like Sunak did it, I doubt they could pivot so fast from Sunak being Superman to Sunak being the demon yeah. in time. And it, and that would be quite a significant thing to do. Okay, so in terms of two banners, like I, I, I'm, I'm going to very much build on what you've just said, that the two banners that I think uh, that are realistic and achievable, there's already been action on both fronts, are one, to change the metric at the heart of public policy making, that we move from GDP to a welfare-oriented, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, effectively it means that... Um, Rishi employing Kate Rayworth as his as his not yeah. right hand woman. <laughs> That'll do. And and, and that this that this not just be a cosmetic because by by changing what you the things that you measure you don't necessarily affect any change unless you take that seriously. Yes. Putting putting a post gross domestic product metric at the heart of public policy. Yep. The second is to employ as Kate's other right hand woman Maria Matsukato. Okay. 
by Jan Matsukato, in other words, that the that government policy be focused on specific missions. So you're changing the shape of government from vertical silo based to horizontal mission based. Right. Uh, and among those missions are going to be climate change, biodiversity loss, public health, on and on and on. Hi, can you say a little bit more? Because I'm not fully understanding the difference between silo-based and horizontal, vertical and horizontal. Can you say what vertical looks like and what horizontal looks like? So the, the vertical is that, um, like, the, 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 so the silo is the government department. So let's say, for example, one of the areas that is ripe for missioning that Mariana mentions in her most recent book is transport. Now, at the, minute, at the moment, the transport department does transport. It does roads, it does bicycles. It doesn't talk necessarily to people in the health service hmm, okay. or who are all the other departments that have, a, 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 in terms of diet, I mean, again, another one is obesity. So it's it's not just a health issue. Yes. It's a range across government departments that traditionally have found it really difficult to to talk to each other and their focus has been an activity that in some way will contribute to GDP often. Right. Right. Yeah, it's why they're building a new relief road around Rosemary. For example. For example. <sighs> yes, right. Okay. So we change the focus and then we create what Tony Blair was trying to do when he talked about what was it? Intelligent governance or something? I can't remember. He had a phrase, didn't he, Blair? Evidence led government. It wasn't that. But anyway, that idea where departments actually talking to each other. Yes. And having a common goal. Yes. So what would so transport transport to be efficient and in people's welfare. The underlying government then would have to have an ethos, something to which all of these missions were targeted, like the winning of a war. In, in the way that in the old days, what would be the aim of these horizontals? Well, I, I, th- I, think, it, I think it's a donut. I think it is Kate Ray with it is It is how do we inhabit the safe and, what does she call it, the safe and something space for humanity, the safe and just space for humanity? Yeah. So in other words, that, we're, 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 that the, the overall meta objective of government policy is ways of provisioning for ourselves that keep us within the physical planetary boundaries yeah. but the minimum uh, floor below which people should not fall in terms of access to health services mm. uh, nutrition and multiple other indicators that she has developed. I mean I'm guessing all of your listeners will have heard of Kate Rayworth but if not We've, we have, well, if they don't, it's because they haven't listened to previous podcasts, but go on, give us, give us the very brief. Well, just to say that, 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 that Kate, I'm not going to describe it, but, but rather that um, chase up donut economics. Absolutely. If you only read one book this year, it needs to be that one. And actually, in a couple of weeks time, we're talking one week to the people of the city of Amsterdam, its governance of one week to the people of of the citizenry of Amsterdam, because Amsterdam has committed to becoming a donut city. And I think that's going to be a really interesting pair of podcasts. So people, if you want to do any homework, you read Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics. I will link it in the show notes. It'll be the most exciting economics book you have ever read. Possibly also the only economics book you have ever read. But it's well worth reading because it takes it takes us through neoliberalism and why it's not working and takes us to what the models could be that would work instead. So that's a very good, a good bit of homework to end with. So Kate has been, for the last five, six years, she has taught in this programme, this regenerative economics. And so the little anecdote I want to bring is that um, I set off to write a blog that was shamelessly promotional because it was a really good news story about this course. And the, the good news was that one of our graduates from this program had been employed, had just been employed to work for the Donut Economics Action Lab. Rob Shorter, friend of the podcast. And then, Rob Shorter. And then I reflected, ha, huh, there's two members of the team and they've both been through this program. Um, ha, huh, interesting. And then, I, so, I, so this promotional piece, which is really just saying, you know, come and do the program. I then had this reflection that of all the different job titles that I can think of of alumni that have gone through gone through the program, lawyer, anthropologist, researcher, on and on and on, working with Kate, NGO workers, for example. The one 
label that I don't think any of my former graduates have on their desk is economists. Right. I thought that's interesting. You know, what is that? And my little bit, my exploration then it be- began to turn into a real blog rather than a little promotional piece. Was huh? What does this tell us about both the state of economics and the course that we're running? Hmm. The solution that I came to that I articulate in this blog that's on our the Schumacher College website. I link to it. Is that actually there are two different separate disciplines that are parading under the banner of economics, but they've got very little contact. They get a little bit, but not very much. So one strand, which is the dominant strand in the media and society, is economics as mathematics, is focused on markets and money. And it's the fundamental unchallenged assumption is that economic growth translates directly into human well-being Hmm. and therefore is a self-declared objective study into how we maximize economic growth. Whereas the second discipline, which is also called economics, which is what we teach here, is a branch of moral philosophy. It's turning economics to its roots in moral philosophy. So people like Adam Smith and Karl Marx you know, had no notion that economics was primarily about mathematics. It wasn't. It was a fundamentally a study of ethics and um, questioning this core assumption that growth translates directly into economics. So I think that this is just a really interesting little pivot in terms of the power of to condition our thinking. And that if we recognize that actually there are two totally separate disciplines which tend to come to very different conclusions, both calling themselves economics. Yes. And what we want for a world that's going to be regenerative is more moral philosophers who understand how value moves around the world and fewer people who think they're practicing a form of physics that has solid laws. Totally, totally. As, so the, 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 the late lamented David Graeber used to say, all these organizations with their chief economist, we need a suite of organizations with a chief anthropologist. Yes. Oh. I was so keen to get David on the podcast. I, yeah, his loss to the world is so great. We need to stop quite soon because we're we're over our hour. This went in places I really wasn't expecting. I feel we could do several more podcasts without effort. Is there anything that you would like to have talked about that we haven't in closing? I mean, I think it's something that's been on the margin of everything we've talked about is to do with education. Hmm. It's like I, I'm... I've become progressively more fascinated over the years with the learning process. I notice much of my reading at the moment and writing as well is about challenging core assumptions of classroom etiquette in terms of, for example, the the assumed authority of the teacher who is expected to deliver, to transfer a fixed body of knowledge to a largely impassive group of students. The idea that the only learning faculty is the intellect and that actually the body is primarily a vehicle for carrying it around. Hmm. And the idea that that, that education is an individual competitive pursuit and that cooperation is called cheating. A whole series of assumptions in education that I think go right back to Plato again. They go right back to this notion of a competitive, scarce competition on an individual basis. And that is ripe for overturning. Yes. Our other podcast would be, okay, so how are we going to overturn this and what would the world look like but then it would look like Schumacher because so much of what we learned was embodied and spiritual and connected and cooperative indeed but our attempt is to return the learning process to what people would do left to their own devices regain confidence self-confidence in their own their own native intelligence which has been squashed by the conventional system yes and and returning our trust in each other I think, was a big thing for me. Mm. We, we did a podcast last week with the people who've created the video of the children's fire and they said that they were allowing it to spread at the pace of trust. And I thought that was a really yeah. beautiful analogy and it reminded me a lot of Schumacher that what we learned was to trust ourselves and each other and the process yeah. and that only when we had all three of those lined up did the world feel like it was a smooth place but then it felt very smooth it was good so in closing do you want to say a little tiny bit for people who might be interested of how the course is going to be the the economics course in this post-covid world is it going to be more online still we're lucky in that we had actually made the decision to shift 
the delivery format even before COVID. So we were already preparing. Traditionally, the course, as with most of our master's programs here at the college, has been fully residential. So it's a very immersive residential program. Sure is. There were just a number of weaknesses with I mean, we love the model, but we, we, we recognize that in terms of accessibility and affordability, that many people who wanted to come couldn't come. Um, either they couldn't come because they couldn't afford it or because they couldn't relocate to Devon for a year. And so we've moved it to a kind of a hybrid system where of the four six-week taught modules, the first two weeks are in residence at the college, and then the next four are online. Okay. So that's the that's the design we've been working to for this year, but we haven't really been able to do it that way. But our hope is from next year, that from next academic year starting in September, that we will have this new format. Fantastic. Alrighty, I will put links in the show notes to everything that you've talked about and to college and just absolutely people if you ever have a chance to to attend Schumacher in whatever form, it is a life changing experience. So, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on. As ever, totally delightful. Thanks, Amanda. So that's it for another week. Enormous thanks to Jonathan for the spark of his smile and for the depth of his intellect and his thinking and the breadth of his reading and his capacity to bring ideas together into a coherent space that I still think might get us towards a soft landing. I haven't given up on that yet, but even if we're bracing for impact, with thinking like this, we can make it something that leaves future generations proud of us. Looking back to say these are the people who really tried, and they didn't get it right all of the time, but they got it right enough of the time. And that, for me, is what we have to do now. If Kim Stanley Robinson is right, and I will link to his book in the show notes, we have about eight years in which to make a screaming U-turn of how we work, of how our economy functions, of how the world shares its value amongst the people and the other-than-human world. So really, if you're listening to this podcast, we know that you care. It matters more than anything else, I think, now, that we share ideas with each other, that we begin to build the local networks of people who understand what's going on and are interested in making change and then we work out how to give each other agency. So the reading that Jonathan suggested, Kate Rayworth, Mariana Matsugatu, Tim Jackson, all of those are worth reading just to get your heads around the ideas of what can be done. And then Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry of the Future and possibly Bill Gates. I know he's a trigger factor. But I think the time to let go of triggers is about now. Each of these has ideas of what we can do that will work in the timescales that we have. And we need those ideas. So if you're looking for something to read, click on just about anything in the show notes. And meanwhile, we will be back next week with another conversation, as ever. And as ever, thank you to Caro C for the sound editing and for the music at the head and foot. Thanks to Faith for the website and all of the tech. And thanks to you for listening. If you like what you hear, head off and give us a five-star review or click on the Patreon link on the website or anything else that you can think of to help spread the word. If you or anybody else are interested in the ideas of conscious evolution, we have the membership program on the website at accidentalgods.life. And if you know of anybody else who really wants to be part of the generative regenerative dance of the world that brings us to the flourishing future that our hearts know is still possible then please do send them this link and that's it for now see you next week thank you and goodbye